Can you hear me up the back? Okay, thank you. Well, that was a very kind introduction, thank you, and what a wonderful turnout. Uh, if, if we tried this in uh, Australia on a Friday night, no way. <laughs> so um, thanks for coming. It uh, shows uh, uh, the concern, I think, that exists in uh, European countries now for what governments are doing to the people. Uh, so there's, that's the cover of my book. And uh, for, the, for those who might say after my visit that... Uh, uh, disregard these ideas because this person knows nothing about Europe because he doesn't live here and that's the standard thing. They said the same about us in 91 by the way when the outsiders were saying that the construction of the Eurozone was a crazy idea and the same argument was oh these guys just don't, don't live here, they know nothing about it, forget it. And the same thing is said every time a, a person from outside comes and uh, looks at the situation and goes, bloody hell, how could this be possible? That's what the book's about. So we'll start off with a little equation because I'm an economist. And this is the most basic macroeconomic relationship. And I don't need to read it. Spending equals income equals output. You can't have output unless you've got spending because output output is, is made in uh, anticipation of sales and it's, it's spending that then drives employment because firms won't employ people if they can't sell the output no matter how cheap the labour is. If they, ca they don't want to become inventory stockpilers, they want to sell stuff. And there's no such thing in economics of the real world that you can have growth with spending cuts. It's impossible. So keep that basic rule. That's first year macro, you've just learned it. Move to second year. Now this, this uh, fiscal deficit mania that has besieged the world, it's international, it's not just European, is built on a series of destructive mainstream <coughs> economic myths. Now my slides today will have more words than I would normally have, just in case people are struggling to understand my accent. Because when, <laughs> when I go to America, they, people put up their hand and say, excuse me, we don't understand a word you're saying. <laughs> and I say, well, I didn't understand the question, sorry. <laughs> now, mainstream economists who push this deficit mania have somehow managed to convince policymakers who are otherwise sensible and intelligent and also the general population who have intuitive intelligence in terms of economics, they've somehow managed to convince that, those groups that that basic macroeconomic rule is false. They've somehow managed to convince the, everybody that if you cut spending, there'll be growth. Now that's an amazing and a bizarre happening. And we need to think, sort of deconstruct that and think about it. And when we're thinking about the current crisis, I think about it as a private debt crisis. But somehow, the mainstream of my profession have convinced the policy makers that it's actually a sovereign debt crisis. We need to talk about that. Now that basic uh, macroeconomic rule we started with actually defines the scope of government macroeconomic policy. Because what we know as a matter of accounting, it's true by definition, but it's not an opinion I'm presenting here, we know that government deficits, that is the difference between government spending and its tax, their tax, its tax revenue, is exactly equal, one dollar to a dollar, or a euro to a euro, or a penny to a penny, whatever you want to do, to the non-government sector's surplus. So if the government's running a deficit of 3% of GDP, the non-government sector has to be running a surplus of 3% of GDP. Now the non-government sector is made up of the private domestic sector, business firms and households, and the external sector, the trading goods sector. 
So there's compositional shifts within those two, those components of the non-government sector, but the rule doesn't change. If the government runs a surplus, in other words, more tax revenue than spending of 2% of GDP, then the non-government sector has to be running a deficit of an equivalent size of GDP, in other words, building up indebtedness. So we know every time the government runs a surplus, the private sector is running down wealth and building up accumulations of debt, and vice versa. And if the non-government sector wants to overall net save, that is spend less than its income, then the only way that can be is if the government sector runs a deficit of an equivalent size. And so we immediately have an idea of how much the government should be net spending, the size of the deficit it should be running, it's dictated by the desires of the private sector, the non-government sector, to how much they want to net save. And I'm not talking about household savings here, I'm talking overall savings of that sector. And if the uh, non-government sector wants to take out income and put it away into, into saving, in other words, not recycle it back into the spending cycle, think about that basic macro rule, well then, some output will remain unsold that's been produced in the expectation of that previous spending. And so we've immediately got a, an understanding then that if that persists at that, in that state, then there'll be unemployment because firms won't, don't want to overproduce. They'll respond to that that, desire, that withdrawal of spending by reducing output. And so you've immediately got a rule for, for government intervention at a macroeconomic level. The government has to fill that spending gap that's left by the desire of the non-government sector to save overall. It's not rocket science, it's not an opinion, it's absolute fact. And so one, one thing we always know when we're seeing unemployment rising in a, an, an economy, the, 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 the one thing we can be absolutely sure of is that the fiscal deficit is too low. Because the net injection of spending above taxation receipts, which are withdrawing purchasing capacity, the net injection of government spending is too low if there's unemployment, mass unemployment or unemployment's rising. It means that the, the desire to save of the non-government sector becomes incompatible with the political aspirations of the government. That's about the almost second year macro. Now, governments understood all of that. We used to understand all of that. That was taught to undergraduates, postgraduates wrote PhDs about that in various ways. And it was, it was the dominant paradigm in macroeconomics. And I'm obviously simplifying for speed. And what, what that sort of understanding led to was policy makers making sure that the deficits were large enough to fund the savings desires of the, of the non-government sector. Now, what do I mean by that? That sounds bizarre. It's, you've probably never heard a, a fisc government deficit described in that way. Well, think about it. The savings in the economy, the private savings, are driven by the, the level of income. You, you, you save more when you have more income. And so the only, if you want to have income growing and savings growing in proportion to income, then the government deficit has to make, is be of sufficient size to ratify that private sector desire to save and withdraw that, that income from the spending stream. And so in that sense, you can see the government deficits really fund or ratify our desire to to not consume all of our income. And when we had policy makers who had that understanding, that, that knowledge, then we had really good outcomes, and I've just listed some of them there. We had full employment, which, which was an absence of underemployment, so part-timers could were only working the hours they wanted and weren't 
def having, facing deficient hours. We had participation rates at quite strong and not, not hidden unemployment, and we had very low official unemployment rates. In other words, anybody who wanted to get the working hours that they desired could find an employer that was willing to offer those hours. And that had, that had flow-on effects. There's this expression, all boats rise on the high tide. The most disadvantaged in our, in our communities rose as the income levels rose, as growth rose. Everybody was in on it. Nobody was left behind on the, by, by the economy. And we had in that, if you go through the data, you'll see that the, in the full employment era that ended around 1975, somewhere around there, we had much higher average GDP, growth, real GDP growth rates. We had much higher productivity growth rates. And we had real wages, that's the purchase, purchasing power equivalent of the, our salaries each week. They were growing in line with productivity growth. And that made sense because productivity growth is increasingly demonstrating that output per hour of input is bigger each as you get the growth. And that, that raises the problem, well, who's going to buy all that extra stuff? Well, it was solved because the purchasing power of workers grew in line with, with that productivity growth. And it was a stable situation. And we had you know, other elements like inequality of wealth and income were decreasing and poverty rates were decreasing and a whole range of other things in the less developed countries that were beneficial. Then we had the OPEC. Or the, the mainstream economists, by the way, during that full employment era weren't very happy. Uh, they they were, were always chipping away. I'm talking about people like Milton Friedman here. In the 50s and 60s, they were, they were really not happy with the so-called Keynesian consensus. But they, had, they were muted in a way. They were disregarded because the, the, the um, policy consensus was delivering those outcomes that were, were beneficial to people. And we had a view that society mattered and that the collective will mattered, that we weren't all individuals, we were all in it together. And our government was our agent who was delivering good, which was delivering good outcomes to all of us. We were all rising on the high tide. So when the OPEC uh, oil shocks occurred in the, starting in the mid-70s, uh, it caused you know, major dislocation in, in the world economy because suddenly you had uh, oil dependent, oil dependent nations with massive cost rises in, in the, the firms had to face. And that was interpreted wrongly as a failure of the full employment consensus. It was interpreted as being the final outcome of too much government spending, uh, too much income support, minimum wage excessive, uh, trade unions being too powerful, and a whole range of elements that had, that had defined that full employment consensus. And this, you know, you know the academy took that as an advantage, that, that confusion and dislocation in the economies, and that was the start of, of monetarism. And that's, that we now sort of call it neoliberalism, if you like, although it's an imperfect descriptor. And the other thing was that uh, during this period, transnational corporations were developing and becoming bigger, and global supply chains were, were uh, becoming more important. And this led to a discussion and you know the left of the political debate as well as the right were involved in this and were duped in the same way. This led to this claim that well with this globalisation of, of, of finance and the economy the role of the state was now no longer uh, as powerful as it was before. And what became confused, and I won't go into it, but what became confused in that debate was the growth of the transnational companies, which was a reality, and the growing ideology, the neoliberal ideology that was attacking the state. And the two things were put together and it, wasn't, it was not a valid conflation, but they were put together and, and even the left bought into it. So you had you had in uh, France in, you know, in the early 1980s, uh, Francois Mitterrand doing his austerity turn because of globalisation. 
So all of these elements led to a paradigm break in, in, in that full employment consensus. And, and I haven't got time to discuss those in great detail. And this was a coup. There was nothing, nothing fundamentally really changed. The oil price shock, yeah, sure, it was a big one and it caused a dislocation. But it was a supply side shock, not a demand side shock. And it, and it needed to be dealt with as a supply side shock. But it was a, the, the coup was pushing an ideology because throughout the 50s and 60s, a lot of mainstream economists were really hating the idea of governments running full employment uh, fiscal strategies, because in a way, one of the, one of the uh, outcomes of that strategy was a more equal sharing of national income. Workers were gaining real wages in line with productivity growth. And of course, you know, as corporate power became stronger, <laughs> that, that, that they didn't want to share the national income, they wanted more for themselves. And there's a lot of, uh, lot of evidence that uh, a lot of the reports and so-called independent uh, academic reports of the era saying that the Keynesian uh, paradigm had failed were funded by corporations. And that, that, uh, if you've seen the movie Inside Job, you'll see that that, that problem uh, persists even today. And of course, all the things I've got listed there happened. Uh, all the things we're now familiar with, which, which started this era of that's led to this austerity period. And a couple of things that were really important that characterised this era. For the first time, there was a break between real wages growth and productivity growth. For the first time. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> He's pro he or she is protesting. <laughs> Political activism. And why, why did that matter? So for the first time, productivity growth was going like that and real wages were only growing like that in, in a, a significant number of countries. Well, why would that gap matter? Well, if you think about it, uh, uh, if, if the, the capacity of the economy to, per hour is, is it chucking, you know, shunting out goods and services is growing that fast, and the purchasing power of workers to buy that stuff is only growing that fast, if at all, well then how, how are the firms going to keep selling all of that stuff, to put it crudely? Well, the answer was solved by the massive financial market deregulation. Because the way in which, they ma which the system maintained consumption growth, because household consumption is the largest component of aggregate spending in the economy, in every country. So how did that consumption growth keep pace with the growing output capacities of the economy? Very simply, that, and it's called financial engineering. That's, that the deregulated markets suddenly uh, found that they could, they could win because they could not only increasingly uh, in, in debt the pr household sector and the corporate sector, and, and, and we could maintain our spending growth by our, with our credit cards, but they'd also, so, so they'd still get the sales, but they'd then get interest on the debt. Win-win for them. And it was at this period that the fetish against fiscal deficits began. And a number of articles started to appear in the 70s and early 80s, just uh, ridiculous economic journal articles about the, the, the deficits. And there was, there's a paper just come out in the last couple of days, if, you, if you've followed the news, the economic news, where some uh, uh, bankers, of, uh, central banker researchers have tried to uh, uh, verify the empirical research of some of the key economic articles over the last 25, 30 years, and they can hardly verify many at all. So, you know. My profession's a disgrace. Here, this this uh, gap between productivity growth and wage and real wages growth was not just an American, Australian, British thing. There's Finland. So this, the trends were happening here as well, and that the break is around. Well, your break really occurred big time in the big ninety early nineties downturn, but it was starting to occur in the late seventies too. <coughs> 
And uh, a recent Bank of Finland financial stability report identified one of the major risks for the Finnish economy as being the, the massive build-up of household debt. And those two, those, that graph and that statement are connected and they're connected in every country. That the only way growth could occur in that period was by the growing indebtedness of the private sector. And the reason why governments were able to run smaller fiscal deficits, even surpluses in this period, was nothing to do with them being responsible. It was that they were being flooded with tax revenue by the growth that was being stimulated by the in increasing indebtedness of the household and firm sector. So in Australia, for example, we went, the household sector in 1985 or something had uh, uh, debt of around 60% uh, of disposable income. By two, the year 2000, it was 170%, something around there. And that's a, that's a familiar pattern everywhere. Now, to, 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 to think about what we, to, to, to try to understand what we think about all of that, I make two, two types of monetary systems here. The general case, which the majority of the governments uh, are in since, uh, since the early 70s, is that uh, we have currency issuing governments who can never run out of money. So the Australian government, the American go US government, the British government, Japanese government, you name it and I can be, give it a tick. They can never run out of money. They issue their own currency. They, their central bank cooperates very closely with the treasury departments and the central bank can control the short, sets the short term interest rate. And if it wants to, can control any interest rate it wants at any maturity along the yield curve, 30 days, three months, five year, 10 year, 30 years, whichever maturity you want to pick, the central bank could control that interest rate if it wanted to. And these general type of monetary systems and governments float their exchange rates. Now the Eurozone is a special case because it doesn't do any of those things. And uh, the, my book, the first half of my book traces the sort of history of the development of the monetary union. And what you, what you learn from that, from what I learned from that study, going back to the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, and really all the evolution of ideas, was that the, that the major economic inputs in before Maastricht, say the Werner Report 70, McDougall Report 77 said that if you want to have monetary integration and you want it to work and be effective, then there were certain things that had to be in place for that to, be, to happen. The, the, and summarising, the, the major things that had to be in place were that you needed a federal fiscal capacity. In other words, a, a treasury department at the federal level not at the member state level, at the federal level, like the Australian government or like the American government, that could have the capacity to redistribute spending across the, the geographic space, in other words, across the member states, and could ensure that there were injections of, of spending, net, net or deficit spending, into, into parts of the federation that were struggling with, with uh, spending, private spending. And it was quite clear to them that the only way you could make it work is if that was the case. And they also said that it would be better if that federal fiscal capacity was embedded in a democratically accountable process via, say, the European Parliament. And it was quite... They said, if you can't do that, it won't work. And uh, McDougall report in 77 went one step further and said, well, our analysis, and I'm paraphrasing, our analysis of the political realities of the, the, the member states at the moment in Europe is that the desired design of the monetary system that would make it work would not be politically possible at this time and therefore there needs to be more political work to, to bring awareness to the member states on what they've got to give up, the powers they've got to give up in order to make the system work. <coughs> 
Now, what happened, of course, was then mon monetarism, that, that monetarist coup I talked about, sort of came across the flanks of all the political debate about integration in Europe. And by the end of the 80s, Delors was uh, the Delors report, which basically then became the design of the Maastricht Treaty in 91. Uh, the Delors report had eliminated all the references to uh, the need for a federal fiscal capacity. If you read that report, you'll find uh, that, the, that, oh, we don't need it. We can uh, situate, uh, uh, it was called the principle of subsidiarity, and we can situate the fiscal capacity at the member state level, no problem. And uh, we can uh, function effectively with a central bank that's not a part of any government. In the general case, in the Australian government's case, the central bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia, is intrinsically part of government. Same as the Federal Reserve Bank in America, same as the Bank of England. Each day they've got to talk to each other and work out the liquidity situation in the cash markets. The system wouldn't work otherwise. They're intrinsically related. Whereas the, the Delors report said, no, we don't need that. We'll have the ECB and uh, and it won't be part of the member state fiscal system. And despite all the failures in the past, so despite the failure of the snake and the, the, the well, before the snake, the Bretton Woods system, the snake, the EMS system that then emerged, despite what happened on Black Friday, uh, uh, all of those events were, were demonstrating that the attempt to fix exchange rates, in other words, currency values between member states, failed every time. That the, that the economies and the trading sectors of the European member states at those various times it was expanding were such, they were so different that you could never retain, maintain a stable fixed exchange rate system throughout. And that ultimately Germany would dominate because of its trading strength. That was all ignored and of course they, they surrendered, the, as well as surrendering their currencies. So the member states use a foreign currency in the Eurozone. It's not their own, it's foreign to them. As well as surrendering their currency, they suspended, their, they, they uh, ditched their ability to, set, to let their exchange rate float. Now, what are those... Uh, what are the myths that I said back up the... The, the, the general case I, I did so that you'll think about the, the next part. What are the myths that pervade in the public debate that lead to governments believing that you can have spending cuts and you'll get growth. Well, here's a whole list of them. Uh, uh, even even uh, the President of the United States claimed that the US was going to run out of money. And this is this, uh, the myth is that governments are just big households. Well, no, they're not. A household is a user of the currency that the government issues. And now I'm talking in the general case. And if I want to spend as a household, I have to either earn income, run down previous savings, borrow money, or sell some assets. The government doesn't have to do any of those things to spend if it issues its own currency. So that, that myth that the government can run out of money at some time and therefore needs to keep its spending under control or cut its spending is false. And, and governments must live within its means. That's sort of touted out almost every day. Well, well what are the means that a government has? If it's, a, if it's the general case, a currency issuing government the, the, is not financially constrained at all because it issues its own currency. So the only understanding you've got that the means that are available to governments are the real resources that are available in the nation. And, and so you know that if there's idle labour, that's a real resource, then the government is certainly spending too little if the private sector don't want to buy up all the labour and there's idle labour, in other words, unemployment, well then the economy is wasting its means. 
And so the government could, which issues its own currency, can always buy all of the idle labour if it's available for sale in its own currency. Of course, we all are in the countries we live in. So this is a nonsensical statement that, oh, the government's got to live within its means where therefore it has to balance its budget. Well, that's just total nonsense for a currency issuing government that's facing unemployment. It means it's not spending, net spending enough. Fiscal services are national savings. Well, no, they're not. The meaning of savings is that, uh, for, for, for me, is that I save because I want to postpone current consumption uh, to build up resources so that I can have more future consumption. Well, that doesn't apply to a government. The government can spend whatever it wants now, and next period, it's not constrained by its previous spending decisions. I'm const I have to allocate my consumption over time and save and spend more later if I want to have more future consumption. A, a government doesn't have to do that. Fiscal deficits drive up interest rates. You've heard that one quite often. Well, that's, that's another myth. The central bank sets the, sets the interest rate. And the argument that that has to, derives up interest rate is based upon this idea. It, it, it came from the, a, a classical economic theory called loanable funds theory, where there was an assumption that there was only a certain amount of saving in, available. And if, if uh, one group of borrowers was trying to access that saving, then the government came along and tried to get it access to the scarce savings, then the savers would be pushing their, their, their rates up to get access to that limited pool of savings. Well, that's not a description of the real world at all. In the real world, savings grows with income. And so if deficits are stimulating growth, then savings are growing ahead of, of, as well. But moreover, the, the mainstream economics has a totally weird idea of the banking system. Banks will lend to any credit worthy borrower. And they don't have to have a, a bank a modern bank isn't a deposit-taking institution that then lends out its deposits. A, a, a modern bank welcomes people into borrow money and then they worry about where they're going to get the reserves to back the loans they make later. And if they don't get enough deposits, they can always go to the central bank and get, more, more, get reserves at a price. So the idea that in somehow by governments running deficits, they're taking away funds that would be available for private investors to borrow and create productive infrastructure. It's just false. Fiscal deficits cause inflation and then you get the Zimbabwe sort of in the next breath of air. It used to be Weimar Republic, but we've, sort of got mo we've become more modern and now we use Zimbabwe as the scare. Well, Mostly people who use that have got no idea of what happened in the Weimar Republic and have got no idea of what happened in Zimbabwe. And what happened in Zimbabwe, briefly, is that uh, the, the government wanted to reward its uh, freedom fighters who broke away from the colonialists. And they, that, it was an admirable uh, ambition, but they just were, implemented the, that ambition in a stupid way. They gave them the farms. Zimbabwe farming was the most efficient farming in Africa and very efficient by world standards. And of course you take uh, freedom fighting soldiers and you give them uh, an efficient farming. The soldiers have no understanding of farming. You give, give them the farms, what happens? Output shrinks by about 60%. That's what happened. So it's no surprise that at high hyperinflation when you have a massive contraction in, in supply capacity. That says nothing about about the, the risks of running fiscal deficits. That just tells you if you can't produce, if your output falls by 60%, any spending is going to be excessive and cause inflation. And if you understand the history of the Weimar Republic, you'll know that a similar sort of supply shock occurred there. Now, all, the other point is that all spending can, as attaches, has an attached inflation risk. Government spending, household consumption spending, private spending, export revenue, all of it is, carries a risk of inflation. And if it becomes excessive relative to the supply capacity of the economy to produce real goods and services, you'll get inflation. 
But if, if governments run net positions, in other words, deficits, that just soak up that spending gap that the non-government sector wants to say, well, then there won't necessarily be any inflation at all. In other words, if there's idle resources in the economy, in other, say, labour resources, and the government seeks to employ them, why would that be inflationary? And we've got this, this, this absolutely bizarre claim that's, uh, that's uh, touted around in the latest uh, austerity sort of narrative. And this is this expansionary fiscal contraction story. And if you go back into the 1970s and, uh, and well, earlier than that, but the modern variant was the 1970s, you'll, you'll come across this uh, rather sophisticated sounding term called Ricardian equivalence. It's, a, it's one of these uh, opaque jargons that economists use. And what this, uh, and I'm summarising here, it's a, it, was, it was technically developed in the literature, but what it says is that consumers and households become, if governments are running deficits, consumers and, house, and uh, firms, be, households and firms become so terrified that in the future tax rates are going to become so onerous to pay back the deficits that they start saving now to save up the money to pay for the future tax liabilities. And so that withdrawal of savings is directly the result, uh, sorry, spending now is directly the results of government running deficits. And so the logic is then turned on its head and it says, well, if governments stop running deficits, we will stop worrying about future tax hikes and therefore we'll, we won't save as much, we'll spend more and we'll fill the gap left by the deficits and the economy will grow. Well, if you believe that, come and see me later and I'll sell you the Sydney Harbour Bridge. First of all, the, the assumptions that in the technical documents were bizarre assumptions that don't, could never apply in the real world and I won't go through them. And it's an example in economic theory where results that come out in the public domain as if they're real world applications and, and statements about the real world have been derived in highly mathematised models that are dependent for the results on, on, on sets of assumptions. And if you relax any of those assumptions, the results in the mathematical model don't come out. And so you have these bizarre situations where economists pretend what they're saying in these papers is about the real world. It's not about the real world at all because the, the assumptions that deliver the predictions couldn't have possibly apply in the real world. And of course the evidence of uh, Ricardian equivalence, uh, all the attempts to study it have uh, demonstrated that it doesn't work anyway. And the, the more intuitive understanding and uh, backed up by uh, heaps of research from uh, psychologists, etc., about consumer behaviour and household behaviour is that households aren't going to go on a consumption binge if they fear that their jobs are going to be lost. And firms aren't going to start investing very much if households aren't spending because they don't need to add the extra capacity because they can meet the current reduced spending on the existing capital capacity. How much uh, longer have I done? Ten, good, thank you. And what I always, whenever I'm uh, challenged about all this, I just, my, my sort of uh, smart ass comment is, well, if you believe all of those myths that I put up there, how do you explain Japan? Because for the last 25 years, Japan has been running very large relative fiscal deficits. It has the highest gross public debt GDP ratio of any nation. It has virtually zero inflation. It has maintained zero interest rates or thereabouts, including long-term interest rates, for the last 25 years. How do you explain that if any of those mainstream myths that the economics undergraduates get indoctrinated with by their professors, how do you explain Japan? And of course then they say, oh, well, Japan's a special case. Well, no, it's not. It's a, it's a modern monetary system of, for a fiat issuing government, currency issuing government, with a central bank who knows how to manipulate liquidity.
All right. So with all that build-up of private debt, it was only a matter of time. I mean, people, we were saying, and a minority of economists were saying as early as the mid-90s that this was going to collapse. You can't keep running real wages below productivity growth. You can't keep pushing credit, ever-increasing levels of credit onto the private sector. It's going to crash because eventually that credit will become unsustainable and the private sector will try to restructure their their credit risks and, and starts trying to save and reducing spending. And what happened was it, it crashed, you know, in 2000, and, well, it started in 2007, but 2008. So the, the causes of the crisis go back 30 years. And it was a slow, steady build-up to this vulnerability that the world economy faced. And uh, that crashed, you know, that was sparked by the housing crash in America. But what was important about the current crisis, and still is important, was a, was a very particular type of recession. And it's what we call a balance sheet regression uh, recession. Normally recessions are driven by business firms becoming a bit pessimistic, slowing down their rate of investment or negative investment, which gets you a big V drop, and then they, they get unpessimistic relatively soon, and then you get another V recovery pretty quick. And, and in the past, that used to be made quicker by governments anticipating that drop and they would inject a bit of stimulus that would help investors get positive sentiment again and we'd be away again. And the point is that there were no residual effects. Unemployment rose and then fell pretty quickly and there were no residual effects. Spending dropped and then grew again. And what I mean by residual effects are balance sheet type effects. And what do I mean by that? Well, in a balance sheet recession, the cause of the crisis is financial. That it starts with there being too much private debt. And then that feeds through because of the need to restructure their balance sheets to try to reduce the private exposure to that debt, those debt levels. It then feeds into the spending system. So it starts as a balance sheet problem in the private sector and then feeds into the spending system because people start trying to save and stop spending as much so they can run down their debt exposure. And that's called a balance sheet re recession. Now why is that different? Well, you can't get out of that very quickly because ultimately the only way you can get back onto a stable path of, of growth is once you've paid the, got the debt, the private debt back down to sustainable levels. And that takes a long, lot of saving and a lot of, lot of effort and a long time. And all of that time that that private sector rebalancing is going on, the government sector has to be running deficits, bigger deficits than would be normal. Because it, it has to keep growth going to allow the private sector to keep, keep saving, to allow them to keep running down the debt. So it's not a simple matter of private sector spending dropping and then going back up again. It's going to be a, it's a long grinding process to where the private sector has to reduce its debt exposure and then ultimately gets to a situation where it feels better. So the correct response when the crisis hit in 2008 in both the general type governments and the Eurozone, the correct response of all of the governments would have been to lift the deficits, let them go as far as was necessary to stop the unemployment rising, and that, that would exceed all the fiscal rules in the Eurozone, of course. But the correct response was just to sit at that elevated fiscal deficits, let them be as elevated for as long as, as, long as it took for the private sector to rebalance. Now, of course, the response... So in Australia, we more or less did that, by the way, not perfectly, but in 2009, late 2008, early 2009, the government brought in a historically huge fiscal stimulus and Australia did not have an official recession, one of the few advanced countries to avoid recession. And America, of course, had a recession, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been because they allowed the fiscal deficit to go up very low, in a sizeable way. Now, what the response in the Eurozone was, was typically dogmatic, and myopic and they failed to understand the nature of the crisis that they had on their hands, the policy makers. 
they failed to understand that it was a bit balance sheet type recession. And of course the specific nature of the monetary system that the ideologues had created here meant that it couldn't cope with the size of the, the, the downturn anyway. There was no federal fiscal capacity. So in Australia, the federal government just turned on the, the spending. And the states benefited from that. In America, the federal government, within a few days, just turned on massive amounts of injection of, of US dollar government spending. Bank of England, did, uh, sorry, the government in England, did this, uh, Britain did the same thing. But the structure of the Eurozone really prevented it from doing that. And the, almost immediately the fiscal rules, the Stability and Growth Pact, failed because the cyclical shift in deficits was bigger than the fiscal rule ceilings. And what I mean by that is that a, a, a deficit, a, 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 a fiscal balance has two components. It has the components of discretionary policy choices and then it has cyclical sensitivity and that, by that I mean if you go into a recession the government doesn't have to do anything and its deficit will rise because it loses tax revenue. And so that cyclical response, the so-called automatic stabilisers, blew the fiscal deficits in most countries beyond the fiscal limits of 3% of GDP anyway. So how could have they been constructed in any sensible way? I'm just going to, uh, a couple more slides here. The role of the ECB was, uh, was interesting because while the ECB wouldn't admit this, the only fiscal function that the Eurozone had was the ECB. It was both an implicit treasury and a central bank, which is, which is okay. Uh, but when things were looking really bleak, in 2010, early, in May 2010 specifically, when the spreads between, say, Greek bonds and uh, German bond were going weird, going through the roof, the ECB brought in the security markets program where they started to buy up troubled debt. And, well, you know, I'm sure you, you understand that uh, there was huge debates. The, the German economists said that this was violating Lisbon bailout rules, and it probably was. But what it, what it demonstrated was that a central bank can control any interest rate it wants, and with a particular f level of fiscal injection, which effectively is what it, what it was doing, it could curtail the, you know, attenuate the downturn. And I, I say that without that ECB in injection, the Eurozone would have collapsed financially. But the, the problem was that, uh, that, that the fiscal policy makers, the, the member states couldn't, couldn't do enough because they were bound by these rules. But uh, Brussels certainly could have uh, uh, made special cases in the treaty. If you know the treaty well, there's all these, uh, all these little exits that, that they can, ad hoc exits that they can pursue. But they, re they said that monetary policy would be sufficient. And this is a, a reflection of the overall monetarist ideology that hates fiscal policy and thinks that monetary policy is everything. Well, if you believe that, this, this graph shows the discretionary fiscal shift among the mostly European countries between 2010 and 2014. The big numbers, now I've netted out all the cyclical effects and netted, I've netted out interest payments. And so this is just the discretionary policy choices of the governments. So a big bar out here is a austerity shift. It's going from a larger deficit to a smaller one or, or a, a surplus. And so this Portugal and Greece and uh, Cyprus, these huge, historically massive fiscal shifts. And this is why that matters, because on the vertical axis, on the horizontal axis I've got those bars, the fiscal shift. So a big positive number means big austerity, chosen austerity. And on the vertical axis you've got the change of the unemployment rate over the period.
and, this, uh, and I could do very sophisticated econometric modelling and tell you what the actual sensitivities were, but fiscal policy really matters. Monetary policy alone is relatively ineffective. Fiscal policy really matters. And if you impose austerity, you will not get growth, you'll get contraction and you'll get rising unemployment. Okay, last couple of slides. Uh, the, the other part of this ide monetarist ideology that uh, is, is dominates is this fixation with export-led growth and unit labour costs. And I, you know, you can't walk around a corner without an economist coming up and telling you that unit labour costs are too high. Firstly, there's a difference between a single firm and an economy. If a single firm cuts its labour costs, it can reasonably expect its sales won't be affected. And so therefore its profits will go up. It may employ more people, it may not, probably not. But if you generalise that single experience to a national economy and cut all wages, then you run into the so-called fallacy of composition that was identified years ago. That wages are both an a cost on the supply side and an income on the demand side. And if you're going to cut workers' incomes, you're very unlikely to, to get spending increases occurring. You'll just create a domestic recession. First point. Second point, on, the, on an international level, if everybody's engaging in austerity, in other words, internal devaluation in the Eurozone context, then it's just going to be a race to the bottom. You're all just going to race each other down in, and not improve relatively. The, the other point is that in the general case governments that float their exchange rates, they can gain increased competitiveness relatively easily by letting their exchange rate depreciate. Now what's the difference between an exchange rate depreciation and an internal devaluation? Well, with an exchange rate depreciation, for, econo for economic students it was why Keynes in the 1930s and 40s uh, said that workers would resist real wage cuts through cutting their money wages that they receive per week, but would tolerate real wage cuts through price level rises faster than the money wage rising. And it's the same argument here that an exchange rate depreciation cuts real incomes for the economy, but it does it in a specific way. It cuts it in terms of reducing the capacity of the country to import. Imports become more expensive. But that creates a dynamic within the economy where workers can substitute away from those things. So you know, I live in a small open economy. The exchange rate fluctuates between 50 cents in the US dollar and parity within six or seven years. Massive shifts. What do we do? We don't go to Aspen for ski holidays. We go up to Queensland for a camping holiday. We don't buy as, uh, the, we don't buy as many uh, we don't buy as many imported cars, and we don't turn our cars over as quickly. We substitute away. Firms seize opportunities, so so firms start offering holiday tours in the remote outback of Australia because people will take those camping tours. So with a exchange rate depreciation, there's a capacity of the domestic economy to substitute away from the exposure of the rising import prices. Whereas if you've got an internal devaluation, it just hacks into the money wage levels and uh, uh, conditions of work, etc. You start undermining your domestic economy very quickly. You provide no incentive to substitute away from anything. And if you think about it, most of our major liabilities in the private sector are in nominal terms. And what I mean by that is that I've, if you've got a mortgage, which is our, usually our largest debt, We've got to trump up a certain amount of money each month to the bank to pay it back. That's a nominal amount that we're committed to. And if you start hacking into our nominal income, which is what austerity and internal devaluation does, then that starts compromising our ability to pay our nominal liabilities and still consume other things. Whereas a, a, a depreciation has a lesser effect in that sense. And here's a, my last graph. The purple lines Australia, and that just shows you, uh, uh, this is, uh, these are real exchange rates, and I won't go into the science of them, but they're measures of international competitiveness produced by the Bank of International Settlements in, in uh, Switzerland. And if it goes up, you're getting less competitive internationally, and if you go down, it's more. It includes domestic price levels, and exchange rates and domestic productivity and, and labour costs in the measure.
So I'll forget Australia because I don't have enough time. It's, just, it's, it's a real fun case. But blue and uh, red are uh, Finland and Germany. So what have you been doing? You've been hacking into your economies with austerity. The Germans did it earlier in the, before the crisis because they are more clever because they realised they couldn't manipulate their exchange rate anymore so they had to have the hearts reforms. They were sort of gaming the rest of the member states without really telling them. And uh, so, but look at this, they're both uh, lockstep, I call that, the red and the blue, lockstep. So in other words, all, and I could add all the other Eurozone nations to this and have a very awful graph, but what you'd find is you're all just dancing the same tune. No relative gains against each other at all. So then the, then the question is, well, how much extra are you to out, extra competitiveness are you gaining outside the Eurozone? Not much. But the green line is Iceland. And Iceland had a bigger crash than, than almost any Eurozone country. Its bank sector went broke. But Iceland's a general case government. It has its own currency and its exchange rate floats. And so it didn't have a long downturn. It's grown quite quickly again now. And it didn't hack into domestic prosperity with austerity. It allowed its exchange rate to do the work. And it, that, that drop in the green line is a dramatic improvement in its, in its international competitiveness. It didn't go down the hacking into unit labour costs domestically. It just let the exchange rate do the work. And that's the advantage that the Eurozone masters denied the member states. Once you signed up for the Eurozone, you lost that advantage. Okay, to, to round up, I talk about Nokia a bit. Uh, Nokia has nothing to do with unit labour costs. Since I've been here, I, I keep getting said, well, Nokia shows labour costs too. I will, that is total nonsense. Nokia is in the, in the same class of, uh, of firms and sectors as the British motorcycle industry in the 50s and the, and, and the 60s. Yeah. Uh, uh, as Sony Walkman, as Kodak, as, as Blackberry, nothing to do with labour costs, poor management. And of course the other, th the other problem of your export sector is the EU, the EU is sanctions in Russia. Massive effect on, you, on, on your export sector, nothing to do with unit labour costs. Brussels are telling you, your government to cut the hell out of workers' incomes, yet they're running sanctions which are undermining the prosperity of your country. Ridiculous. All right, so uh, we'll finish there. <laughs> so